This is an odd sort of talk because people go to conferences to learn a little bit about doing security uh, or a little bit about how to write code. Nobody ever really talks about anything actually meaningful about why you should really do security. It's not about stopping hackers stealing stuff. It's about the fact that people are entitled to private lives. We don't talk about that. Privacy is not very high on our list of requirements. And this talk is sort of... A I'm going to have to occasionally poke it. I don't like poking. Oh, could I co-opt you to poke, dear? <laughs> yes, I could do with some. <laughs> and as you've turned up, uh, all you have to do is poke that every time it looks like I'm not talking about what's on a slide. <laughs> My glamorous assistant is an expert in copyright in protected databases. It's a fascinating some of the skills you can find in London. OK. Um, Click. I, 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 I will probably gesticulate and clicking could happen. So um, I gave this talk a couple of weeks back in its, mostly its current form at a Go conference. So later there's a lot of Go code. If people don't want to go through a lot of Go code and accidentally learn Go in the process, that's fine. We'll skip that five minutes. So <laughs> um, these sort of, yeah. OK, I'm also writing a book on Go. And if you want to learn how to do all of the crypto that I will discuss later, the free chapter for the book, which is just about Hello World, has all that crypto in except how to generate HMAX, which is like three lines of code. Uh, so you can go and download it and do all of this stuff offline without ever having to pay me any money, which I think is the best deal you're ever going to get from a book with crypto in. Yeah. So we all have secrets. I mean... We don't really think about the fact we all have secrets. Most of the time, we don't think about secrets at all. Most of the time, we think about all the stuff we're doing that then three weeks later, we think, oh, God, I wish nobody knew that. Um, and this is a natural part of life. And in fact, the secrets that we have are what actually makes the, the general day-to-day -day ability to sit in an office next to other people and work with them happen. Um, yeah. So some secrets are really awful. Uh, I've played certain very popular card game in certain circles that will help you figure out how to dominate the entire planet um, by building your own Illuminati network. There could be such a conspiracy. I have no way of telling. Infidelity. We've had a lot of that in the news recently. Criminality, which as, you know, a fair proportion of the UK economy is untaxed, unregulated, and unknown because it's criminal. It's a growth business, and it's substantial by, economic, by international standards. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we all have secrets that are much less interesting than that. Things that aren't going to ruin us, probably, mostly, most of the time. If somebody gets my bank account numbers, they certainly can probably pull off a good scam and get money out of my bank account. But I don't keep much money in any one bank account. You're protected up to £60,000 by the state against certain kinds of bank account failure anyway. Um, embarrassing incidents, so um, yeah, I don't reconcile my Facebook with anything because of all the dodgy photos of me from like 20 years ago that are on Facebook uh, where I'm completely off my head. Uh, <laughs> sexual preferences, of course, is one of those, those things that actually we all have them, except for the people who actually have no sexual interests at all, and they're just as keen for people not to know that because society has a big problem about that. So, yeah. So, secrecy, because it is the grist of society, should really be absolute. If I have a secret, unless I want to give it to you, you should not be able to get it. Our tech, therefore, must be able to make sure that it can protect all that lovely banal stuff that's the basis of what we care about, secrecy. This also means our tech also has to be able to protect stuff we don't want to protect. Criminality, conspiracies, infidelity. So, yeah. And the thing that nobody ever talks about in crypto talks, and that nobody ever talks about in privacy talks or anywhere else, is actually all of our stuff exists within a framework of laws. We all live in jurisdictions with laws that actually make very specific statements about what secrets can and can't be kept private from the state. Now, here in the UK, 
The vast majority of secrets you'll ever have, you can keep private. The state just reserves the right every now and then to use a court order to get at your bank account records because it thinks you've been involved in money laundering or things like this. If you go to Saudi Arabia, they take the view that absolutely everything about your life is their property whenever they feel like it. Between the two, there's a spectrum between what you could call liberty and tyranny. When we write software at present, if we do do security, we actually go complete to liberty. And don't get me wrong, I'm a libertarian, I'm fine with that, personally. But the trouble is it means that sometimes courts come along to your company, like if you're Apple and you've got an iPhone that the state of California wants to get data out of, and it turns up with a subpoena and you have to turn up in court and say, I can't get the data out. And the court doesn't say, well, you physically can't get the data out, that's fine. No, the court says, oh, well, that's contempt of court. Please get the data out, it's physically impossible. Well, that doesn't matter. So when you're building a system to protect secrecy, you also have to build a system that does have ways of breaking through it. Now, this isn't something cryptographers like to talk about, but it's still part of the, the game. So secrecy is not the same as privacy. Privacy is a slightly lower standard. Privacy is all that stuff that's banal, being protected, while at the same time allowing law enforcement, when really necessary, to get at the stuff they must be able to get at. And this talk is really about where to, partly about where to draw that line, partly about how to actually do both. And then there's a truckload of code that's really insane, and a, a checklist of things that you can actually do when writing software that nobody will ever do, which, which would actually give you a complete black box that would do if you're really going to take the libertarian stance on secrecy work to the extreme, would do it so well nobody will ever crack it, quantum computers included. So, by the way. Okay, so privacy is not absolute. So, there, um, privacy is also, <laughs> privacy also doesn't exist in a vacuum. I have things that I might share with you that between us are private, i.e. we are not sharing them with anybody in a wider circle. For that to actually work, there's an implied contract between us, a trust relationship. We're each anchoring, acting as anchors in this relationship. I'm taking you to be trustworthy, you're taking me to be trustworthy. And that, of course, is a contract. And contracts, as we know from lawyers, get broken a lot. A lot. I mean, that's what courts are for. That's what lawyers make their living off of, broken contracts. So, <laughs> so we've, got, we've got several very good broken contracts recently. Ashley Madison. Now, there's a very strong contract involved in Ashley Madison. Uh, we won't let anybody know that you're a cheating scumbag. Uh, give us some money. Boom, canker. Uh, <laughs> Carphone Warehouse managed to get beautifully compromised and compromise certain mobile phone networks as a result of getting compromised. And then, of course, we have the Office of Personnel Management, and still nobody knows what the full impact of that leak is. Because that's four million federal employees, not just federal work history, their life history and the life histories of all their significant others and of a whole pile of people in their social circles who were looked into as a result of looking into their significant others. All data floating around quite happily. If you want to go and buy it, somebody will charge you some money and give you it. And that's very dangerous stuff to lose. You can't get a life back once you've lost it in that sense. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. So today's topic, therefore, is also applied paranoia. Because all security is applied paranoia. And we've got a lovely definition that's going to come up for genuine paranoia. Okay. This is how, mo well, this is how the dictionary believes paranoia works. It's a mental condition, so a psychiatrist will make some money out of helping you not actually ever get over it. And it sort of, you know, we know areas of life where paranoia is rife and probably quite justified, such as, such as politics. Okay. And we have quite good reasons to be paranoid ourselves. We live in a world where random people claiming to be political actors, but actually mostly in it, I guess, for the lols, will quite happily bitch slap systems because they feel like it. We live in a world where a certain generation at a certain age read entirely the wrong materials, if you think that knowledge is a bad thing. Um, and many of them believe they have skills beyond what they have. And then, of course, we have old-timers 
who actually make a very good living out of the skills that these people think they have, and these people are famous in the press for having. You don't ever meet these people, but banks pay them money in suitcases to explain how they did what they did. I'm getting nods from the person in the room who's seen the transactions. <laughs> well, right, next slide. So, but also, setting aside criminal and lols hackers, we have the famous UFO building out in Cheltenham, which literally has a duplicate of all internet traffic between the United States and Europe, because they've got a beam slipper down in Cornwall, where they literally just take the entire fiber optic cable and make a copy of it. They can't read it, but they're storing it. Storage is a lot cheaper these days than it used to be. We have their friends electric at the National Security Agency. Now, you can't really differentiate the two of them. They're so in each other's pockets. It's, you know, it's a single jet-setting community. But also, we have commercial entities who supposedly are doing good things for their customers. Lenovo Sailfish, how many people would ever expect to find a man in the middle attack sat in the BIOS of their laptop? You know, hi, oh yeah, well, you set up your SSL tunnel, by the way, we're going to swap some root certificates around and do some dodgy stuff, and your advertising is going to be so tailored to you. I mean, that is the whole point of Sailfish. Good advertising. Um, I, I was having a conversation rather drunkenly last night with somebody, and I've forgotten what the actual bit of Linux involved is, but somebody's actually taken a similar sort of concept and moved it down into the Linux kernel so that you can inject device drivers at runtime into kernel space. And I'm thinking to myself, I can inject a device driver into kernel space? What is that? I can man in the middle of kernel? And what nuts causes that? We also have the fact that we live in a world where most people want to build premium businesses. Actually, forget about states. States aren't the threat. Forget about numpties who want to advertise. They're not the threat. These are the people who are the problem. And these people probably aren't that many of the people in this room today. But the last time I gave this talk to about 200 people, and 80% of them were working in companies whose business model was freemium. It was all about the data collection. It was all about repackaging and reselling the data from the users. And in little bits, that doesn't look so bad, but if you know anything about traffic analysis, it's very easy, given three or four sites of source data, to build a very accurate profile of a human being. Don't have to know who they are to know who they are. So, so therefore, I would actually suggest that paranoia in our world, uh, whether you're a developer or not, is actually an incredibly sensible and reasoned reaction to what we should be doing when we build network systems. <sighs> now, I used, to have a cop I used to have a picture of an Aardhaar card down here, and I've taken it out, uh, <laughs> because it's kind of unfair to rib on Aardhaar, because you have to print your own. Uh, so it's not really the Indian government's fault that that's a dodgy piece of paper. It's the fault of whoever decides to print their Aardhaar card out. But we deal a lot of the time with states in places where we know they have control. We go through airports. We do the whole security theater, liminal space, praying to the plane god thing. We get on board the plane and put our shoes back on. Most, here in the UK especially, most civilized, in quotes, countries now have CCTV all over the place. We've got four million odd of these cameras. Last time I, I looked up the statistics here in the U England. Uh, they're actually useless because the resolution on the photography is far too low to ever catch a criminal. Most of English law actually works on the basis that if your face can't be caught, it doesn't count. it's not useful evidence for an automated response, which also means don't ever bother paying dri uh, driving fines for speeding through cameras. Unless they've got your face behind the thing, you have to literally fill in the piece of paper, which is a confession, to say it was you. If you don't fill that in, you're not guilty. Nobody is. Uh, people make that mistake all the time. And down here, of course, we have a whole selection of very useful stuff, uh, travel documents, Travel documents, travel. Yes, none of those is an identity. Oh, yes, identity document at the back. The important one, you'll notice, has no biometric features. No identifying data beyond a name. It, it, you can go along to any registrar's office and find one of these for a dead person and be that person. Uh, so that is the most common form of identity fraud in the UK. So. However, all of that stuff which governments think is being useful, 
we have to trust. They have tanks and guns and bombers. And admittedly, I don't expect a stealth bomber to come over my maisonette in Edmonton Green anytime soon for anything I've done. But I mean, in principle, it could. <laughs> Perhaps I should get stealth sheeting for the roof. That would keep me busy for a few weeks. However, there's another version of reality where it's not governments who have all the power. That's the one that we build. So uh, for those who don't know what this is, this is a panopticon. This was devised by a, a very famous uh, liberal radical in the 19th century called Jeremy Bentham. Uh, a few of these were built. The idea was that every prisoner was kept se separate. Every prisoner was monitored 24-7. The person in the middle could see everything that was going on. Um, they had to take them out of service because about 80 to 90% of prisoners went criminally insane. They couldn't cope with the isolation and the constant being watched. Uh, that tells us something about a world in which people are becoming more isolated and constantly watched. <laughs> Uh, I had to include a dog book because, I mean, after all, out, out, you demons of damn stupidity. Um, customer data is an asset that you can sell, and I have sat in enough meetings where people have said this with a straight face. I've always, I, I always assumed that, you know, it would be trolling, but no, people mean it. And then, of course, if you've watched The Matrix, you know exactly what is inside boxes. Every single bit of data to reconstruct the state at any single point in time. So, we are privileged more so than governments. People don't understand that, and what they stick in our systems they think is inconsequential, but actually, no, it isn't. It's not at all inconsequential. Because um, we're storing real-world secrets a lot of the time that have a financial value or bearing on a person's actual life in a way that what the government keeps doesn't. And on top of that, we have all of this identifying metadata. You know, this is the stuff that all of those big NSA programs are obsessed with getting. Because you have this stuff, you know so much more. I mean, the, the metadata analysis is what actually broke the Nazi war machine. Not being able to decrypt Enigma codes. Because you could map the, the entire German operation across Europe from 1940 onwards. was fully mapped in real time because you've got all the metadata. You know what's going where. It doesn't matter what they're saying. You can figure that out. Somebody on the ground, pair of binoculars. Well, that makes sense from three weeks ago. Suddenly, the key opens everything. So, Now, the trouble is, though, if we're going to build systems that are going to do trust and we're going to take privacy seriously, we also have to ask, who do we trust? So when we put technology in, when you put in security into your systems, effectively, you've got these damn great big bars. Did you build them? Very rarely. So that means you've now got to trust the people who did build them. People. Other people have to make sure that the people who've done these things have really done them. And I know that an awful lot of people in the Agile community really hate being told, no, you can't deploy. We're doing a security audit. But honestly, a lot of code should never be let in the real world if it's not had a security audit. <laughs> it's just the way things are. Yeah. So. so there are three basic things that we have to attack. Firstly, dev practices. I'm not going to talk much about that. I've got a couple of slides that are going to come up with some pretty pictures that will not make any sense to anybody because um, I'm too hungover to remember the detail, to be honest. Um, then I'm going to talk about architecture. Now, that might actually seem like it should be the more difficult thing with a hangover to talk about, but I do crypto tunnels on autopilot, so that's not a problem. And then finally, we do a little bit about operational rules, but not very much, because I'm not really working with ops at present. I'm mostly interested in getting people to realize they can build lockable, unlockable black boxes without it all going wrong. I do hope my, my voice doesn't sound as rough as it does from the inside. Uh, so, privacy and dev practices. Yeah. We all have pipelines like this in what we do. We get some requirements come in from somebody. I do hope everybody says no a lot. It's the best way to deal with bad, <laughs> with bad ideas, is just to say no. That gets split across some code teams who go off. I don't care how they're doing their development. They're hopefully iterating, but how the hell they manage that, I, I, it doesn't really matter. There's some automated testing that goes on, and if they're sensible, they've got a QA before they really push to live. But if they haven't, probably the automated testing results in some kind of deployment. And there's a lot wrong with that model. 
if you're storing personal information. There's nothing here to safeguard that you're not leaking any of it. So it's actually quite easy to fix. For one thing, if, you do, if you're iterating anyway, you're already probably building prototypes as part of what you're doing. And you can actually security test them as you're building them internally. That's not the sign-off. That's not going to live. But that's allowing you as devs to make sure you've covered all the stuff you think you ought to cover. Bang through your automated testing and QA. And then you get some nice gentleman for around about £750 a day who knows OWASP tools properly to sit there and just run all of them against you and say, fine, you're protected against most of these attacks. If you have sense, probably you also, there and there, are running penetration tests. And as Shannon mentioned yesterday, you need red teams and blue teams. I like the terminology. I've not run into it before. <laughs> In the ISP world, we used to refer to them as, as alpha and tiger teams. Because it's sort of like, yeah, hard. We're sort of dropping these marine special forces in your code sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> so architecting, architecting privacy is much more interesting, to be honest. Because fixing process is one of those things that it takes months and you just do it. And when you end up with a process, nobody can quite remember why they went the way they did, but it works. So as a basic... Before anything else, I would assume that everybody already knows that when they're doing secure stuff, they should encrypt all their transports. If it's going over a network, it should be encrypted, unless it's something that's absolutely not useful. You know, like marketing pages and stuff like that. Um, if you're relying on HTTPS to do this as part of doing web architecture or whatever, that's fine as long as you make sure that you are always up to date and you do follow all the CVEs, and you're not relying on OpenSSL to actually be good. Uh, it's slightly trolling, because I mean, Ben Laurie and a couple of other members of the OpenSSL team do live here in London, do work for Google, and actually are very good at what they do. But of course, OpenSSL is just a behemoth. It's the size of it that makes it difficult to really be certain it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, Public-private keys. I mean, basically, I'm going to walk you, walk you roughly through what HTTPS does. There's a cert, hopefully, sat up at the server side so that I can be certain when I talk to the server that it is who it reports to be. There's probably some DNSSEC to make sure that when I look up the server, I can actually be certain it's at least in the right domain tree. Uh, DNSSEC isn't actually a very good solution to is this the correct server, but it is a good solution to has this server been tampered with recently because it takes a long time to propagate. So, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, not the, you, it's not the area you would want to do in a cache poisoning attack on a DNSSEC tree just because you've got to do the work. Um, but anyway, so you establish secure channels by giving a public key and getting a public key, and then you can talk over that. Now, SS, you know, if you're using HTTPS, you're going to use hybrid crypto, which is going to get a lot of mention through here, basically. You're not going to use RSA for doing all that comms, because RSA is a lousy, heavyweight, big key mechanism. And you're going to use AES, or, or some other symmetric cipher, because it's cheap. And that's all well and good. There's a very nice trick the SSH clients do, which is they actually pin the IP addresses for particular certs. So if the IP address changes or the cert changes, you have to re-authenticate that as being a valid place you want to talk to. And this is something that most of us should be doing in all the network code that we write. Just to, especially, especially more than anything else, internal code. If you're building a microservice architecture and your components aren't talking over secure channels with all the certs pinned down, somebody's going to get into your network and then they are going to have fun. And you're not going to realize they're having fun because all the traffic's encrypted. <laughs> so um, change keys very frequently, especially symmetric keys. It's very cheap to do because they're very small, they're very cheap to generate. If you've got a HSM that's kicking out 300 and 20,000 bytes a second of genuinely random data stream, and you're taking 16 or 32 bytes of that to use. That's an awful lot of connections you can be feeding per second with a fresh key. Um, 
And whilst I'm not going to talk much about one-time pads, because for one thing, none of us actually really do do one-time pads, even though we talk a lot about using one-time pads in a lot of systems. Because uh, there's this key constraint that everybody always forgets. You have to bind a distinct key to a distinct message, and if the message ever gets used again, you have to use the encrypted version that was encrypted with only that key to get the full protection of Shannon's one-time pads. I mean, I chuck one-time pads around like confetti, but I sort of tend to lower this restriction because it, this actually is very, very easy to attack with traffic analysis, <laughs> oddly. Um, next slide. So we're going to walk through some Go code. This is going to be quick. By the end of it, you'll know all of Go. Um, I can do, I've got a full Go lightning talk. It's 3 minutes 40 seconds at full speed, and it teaches the entirety of Go in that time. And I just managed to avoid getting kicked off stage at a Ruby conference by getting it in under four minutes. <laughs> so, uh, welcome to a Go, uh, very simple Go program. Anybody, um, yeah. Basically, there's a, the version of this talk I normally give shows the encrypted and non-encrypted ways of doing stuff. But you know what? You shouldn't do the unencrypted ways. There's no point. I agree with Google in their whole move to this whole new web of everything encrypted. I just don't like their way of doing it. But anyway, so next slide. The main thing that's important here is there's a HTTP library. It works by taking a closure that will print out something that will basically shove some stuff in a buffer and then get you dumped out. And I think there's another slide after this that shows the, ne yep, the next bit. And this is literally all you have to do in a Go program to have a perfectly reasonable clean room implementation of TLS, I think 1.3 now, just running and serving content. That's it. I can show how to do it slightly less code in Ruby just, but unfortunately stuck on OpenSSL. So Go is an incredibly light language in which to do crypto, which is why all this code is in crypto and not in, in um, this crypto is in Go rather than in C and stuff like that. Um, I'm not really a fan of web services, to be honest. Um, you present stuff to the outside world, and people like web interfaces, and that's fine. But when you're actually building stuff internally, and you want to have control over your crypto environment, you're much better off to actually roll your own stuff over TCP, because you haven't got all that lossy in interpretation of translating strings backwards and forwards and all of that. And it's a lot less garbage on the wire. And binary protocols tend to be that bit much more difficult to apply plain text attacks against, just because text-based protocols tend to have very clear text that everybody knows, you know, it's public knowledge. So it is yet again very simple to set up a TLS server that's over TCP. It, it's all baked into standard library, so yeah. <sighs> yes. We've got a cryptographically secure random number generator, because everybody has these days. And the pattern of code is pretty much the simple, the same, chuck around a closure. Uh, do some stuff so you can listen. That's basically it. And you need to be able to configure TLS, which, yet again, is taken care of for you. So. Uh, writing a client is slightly more bizarre, yeah. I thought it was best to include client and server versions. Um, it's ever so slightly more bizarre because actually probably most of the time, most people, if you're working on the public internet, shouldn't verify certs. Because the vast majority of certs you're likely to actually deal with are probably self-signed. And therefore probably don't verify. Um, and that actually, if it, if you ask it to verify a cert that can't verify, you get a panic. And most people don't like the, the handling for coping with the panic. So. But there's not a lot to it. And it, it's sort of, it's, as I said, I'm going to flip through this stuff quickly. I just really wanted to show that there's coverage from one end straight the way down. And that Go is a very easy language to put code together for doing this stuff. Um, UDP, I apologize for calling this a server. But the trouble is that effectively every UDP system consists of two entities, each of which is a client and a server, in different contexts. And I know we tend to, that's not how we normally think of UDP, but it's how it nearly always falls out when you write the damn code. So here, our purpose is to basically just have two UDP things 
talk to each other using stuff encrypted with AES. If you're not using AES, use it. I don't think it needs more of a big up than that. It's like it's cheap. The, the, the cost between doing public key crypto and doing symmetric crypto is orders of magnitude difference. So as long as you're not relying on symmetric crypto to have one key lasting for a long period of time, and it's incredibly cheap to swap them per communication because they're so small, uh, you can actually build very, very fast crypto architectures by just relying on AES to do all of the, the internal crypto and managing your key rollover properly. Whereas a lot of people think the first thing they should do to secure their infrastructure, get themselves a nice big cert from one of the dodgy companies and then pin everything down and do RSA all over the place, which is an awful way of doing it. And this code, that's, this, is probably, this is the second deepest chunk of code on the entire thing. And basically, it just shows you the simplicity of do a UDP, encrypt something, and I apologize for the function called quantize. I couldn't think of any other good name to describe not having obviously spottable block padding, which is really what that's about. So, um, yeah, I think there's two. Just flip through them. I'm not really excited by them this morning. That's good. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God, God, I could go mad. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, if you're going to write a server, you're going to write a client. It's nice to have client code. So I think just there's not really much to this. I mean, it's, the one has to do some packing up to send over the wire. The other has to do some unpacking, but just to flip through them, yeah. Who's ever thought of using public, well, public encryption on a UDP packet? Because, I mean, the point of, of, of public-private key pairs is they're quite big. I mean, the, the st I wish HSM man manufacturers would get their heads out of their asses on this and give us the capacity to store more than, than 2K keys normally. But unfortunately, government standards tend to like 2K keys. But, you know, I mean, you want to do RSA and you want a reasonable degree of security. 4K keys are quite nice and they're modern hardware. It's not that awful. Um, but you don't normally think of UDP packets as more than 512 bytes, which, of course, they can be, if you really want them to be. Um, so this is basically just an example to show that you can do RSA very, very easily over things. So flip through. Yeah, again, all of this is in the Go standard libraries. Same as the client, just flip through it. The point is, symmetric crypto combined with public-private crypto gives you hybrid cryptography. The advantage of hybrid cryptography is people are looking at the wrapper. You've got something locked down with a very big set of public-private key pairs and some certs, and you can make a lot of uh, promises with the other party about what the envelope looks like. But assuming that somebody cracks the envelope, they just entered your land. What goes through these tunnels? What have you put in the envelope? And the great thing with AES is, I don't have to be symmetric in the keys. We think of it as symmetric crypto, because both sides need to have the key to encrypt and then decrypt. But if I'm talking two days down a tunnel, I don't have to use the same keys from each side as the encrypting keys. I can swap keys over through an out-of-band channel, and I can have two completely separate crypto tunnels. That you've got to compromise both of them to understand the full communication. I can roll over the keys any time I like on either half of the tunnel. I can put more tunnels through. There's nothing to say that I've only got one, one set of tunnels. I can have dozens of tunnels going through this. So by having hybrid cryptography, you open up the ability to do infrastructures and architectures you could never do if you're just relying on one method of encryption. The downside is, of course, don't stick more RSA through RSA. It decreases the entropy of the RSA and makes it easier to crack. And the same with AA, AES through AES. Don't stick another tunnel inside one with the same crypto method. So that's kind of, yeah. Okay. There's another side to this, though, because being able to say, well, I can build complicated crypto architectures isn't the same as being able to say, I can be sure that what I get is what was intended to be sent. Because you've got to know when somebody's actually broken a key. And the easiest way to know if somebody's broken a key is to also add a signature. Now, there's lots of standards for digital signatures that various contexts. HMACs um, have the advantage that they are incredibly cheap to calculate. 
Um, I built something for HSBC a few years back in Ruby, a uh, secure uh, single sign-on system with a black box database. And I signed everything with HMAX. I had HMAX all over the place. Um, and yeah, fractions of a millisecond, of a microsecond even on the server that was running on, was spent with actually generating the, the signatures for the messages. The, the cost was actually the public-private keys to set everything up. And then after that, everything else was incredibly cheap. So. The great thing about then combining crypto and signature is you move back out of tech. These move you back into trust. Trust is a place where you can start getting into identity, about knowing who you're dealing with. And also, trust is an area where you can anonymize. Because if two sides trust each other, they can minimize how much they have to share. They only have to share enough for the trust. So. Oh, yeah, I stuck in a couple of examples of HMAX in Go, so just flip through these. Basically, they're things that have to go. Ah. I promised I was never adding any more to the free chapter of my book because 60 pages for free and it's all crypto does seem a bit mad. And then I realized I'd not put any examples of doing HMAX in, so now I've got to put another page in with the HMAX code. So, yeah. I mean, the main thing is. Oh, actually, this is awful code to read as well because I mean, it's just, there's a lot going, going on. But the basic trick is I sign something. We've agreed a key that's used for the signing separately. You can then check I've signed it. You sign the content. I sign the content I want to send, not the encrypted version. And I put the signature with the encrypted version. And it flies down the network. And you take the signature. And you do the decrypt. And then you run the same key for the HMAC. And then you say, yeah, they match. Or they don't. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of doing it the other way around, signing the encrypted thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't actually tell you if the content in the encrypted thing you receive is the content you wanted. So it's a very... I've got a, um, a friend, Tony um, Arcieri in the Ruby community, who's got an excellent blog post on the subject of people doing their signing the wrong way around. So, so. so if we're going to encrypt all transports, and we've now got the technology to basically stick crypto wherever we want, we might as well also encrypt all passwords. Uh, the first thing on my list is very contentious, because actually probably if you pick the wrong Unicode encoding, accepting Unicode is a great way of not expanding the symbol space, but actually putting a lot of plain text attacks around zeros in. Um, so you want a wrong length encoding for Unicode, not 32-bit Unicode. Um, but you should never receive a password from anybody. You should have the, the client that's talking to you actually create a hash of the password. You should give them a key that's unique to that, that you store off and will stay with them for however long the password lasts. And you should only ever receive the hash, because many people use the same password on many different sites. And there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to use a different password on every different site if every site doesn't take the password, but takes something that's generated that you need a key to generate. Um, if you're going to generate hashes, always use HMAX. They're not that expensive. Um, also, sort things and hash again. You just expanded the, the number of state spaces that somebody has to look through to find the answer. And in fact, one of the, the easiest things you can do if you've got a token that just needs to be immutable and usable again, as identity is that basically you can just stick hashing in wherever you feel like, and you can do many, many thousands of rounds of it. Because the, what most people are going to do if they're going to try and break password table is they're going to try rainbow table attacks. And if they've got to build this size rainbow table, that's quite difficult. You need a big server. But if they now have to take that to the power of 10,000, they're not doing a rainbow table attack. Uh, and 10,000 rounds of hashing is incredibly cheap. It's in the order of millis that is in the order of milliseconds rather than microseconds, but it's still cheap. Um, yeah. A lot of people are very obsessed with two-factor authentication at present. Um, I've written this in the context of two-factor because that's what most people are going to do. But actually, you should require multi-factor authentication. If somebody has more than two devices registered with you, don't always send the confirmation signals to the same device. Send it to the other device. Make them carry more than one device. <laughs> you know, um, that isn't necessarily as onerous as it sounds, because uh, effectively in a device, you can have arbitrary number of virtual devices buried. And then you combine where it goes and how you get at it. 
Uh, confirmation code should always be sent out of band, and yeah, okay, so sending via an SMS is out of band. Um, they shouldn't be six-digit numbers. They certainly shouldn't be six-digit numbers that seem to have a high predictability, and often you get the same code back over the course of the week, uh, as a certain bank that we've been observing does. <laughs> a six-digit number is prone to the, exactly the same kind of password attacks that you would expect anywhere else. If somebody's in a position to actually look at the system that's going to be receiving and the system's going to be generating, over time they will figure out what the random sequence is because it's not likely to have a hardware security module behind it. It's not likely to be genuinely random. A lot of people would have used secure random, which um, is a beast of investing in many software bases over the world. Um, yet again, don't get the confirmation code back. Have your software in the time turn it into a HMAC and send back the HMAC. And make it go through a key book. Make it chuck away keys each time it does it. You've got an uh, agreed set of keys you share or whatever. I mean, this is, this is trivial 19, late 19th century spy stuff. Yeah, we've both, both, both got a copy of Moby Dick. Uh, I'm only going to use the word at uh, position three on page four now. You know, it, it's actually how to, how to communicate without people knowing who and what was sold a long time ago. It's just we don't tend to do it in the digital world. We expect to find clever algorithms that will fix it for us. Um, but the great thing about confirmation codes and multi-factor authentication is every device you authenticate by, you now have another secure channel. Secure channels are great because they can be used by both parties to eavesdrop on what the other channel is supposed to be doing. So um, we have an example of something we did, we've did we done for a client where effectively we use a secure channel itself to share a secret. And it means that you can let a child log into a website and you're with an identity that's possessed in your mobile phone, or their mobile phone. But either way, your mobile phone ends up with the back channel, and you can press log out whenever you want. No way for the child to stop it, because the child isn't in the band of communication to stop it. Which is an incredibly powerful feature to have, to be able to monitor what's going on on your privileged connections from another one of your privileged connections and kill that one. We don't tend to think enough about being able to kill what's going on. Encrypt all your storage, and this is a bit of a personal bugbear, because once you start doing search of the encrypted databases, it's kind of addictive. Um, because you can think of so many different weird schemes that mean that anybody takes the database and all they have is a big random pile of noise, and if they have a quantum computer, they still just have a big pile of noise. Um, this is a place where one time pads come in very handy, uh, because suddenly you can, you can go down to record level, field level, uh, in the granularity of how you want to encrypt stuff. And honestly, if somebody gives you two terabytes of data, average field length, 70 to 120 bytes, every single field encrypted with a different key, and they haven't got access to the keys to unlock it, how long do you think it is going to take them to brute force that database and find out about more than one of your users? But it's not going to take you very much long to generate the data. The crypto to actually put the data in there, that's secured, is no slower than the crypto you've already just been doing to get two boxes to talk to each other. So um, you do have to actually build the index as you go though, and effectively chuck away the index. You need to decide what data goes in can be found again in the future. Because all you're actually ever going to store, if you want to search these things, is a HMAC of a query that you would want to run against that field. Which is, you know, Fine, I'm going to look up all the data about uh, people called Thomas. Well, if I've populated the, field, the, the database so that people called Thomas all have a HMAC that you search on, you can find the records. You can't see anything about them beyond the fact that you knew that you were looking for Thomases. That's still, uh, you know, traffic analysis can still do things with that. But on the other hand, if I didn't actually index it at all on Thomas, I insisted on using the full name, then now the only record that they're ever going to get back will be of a person whose only name is Thomas. So, and most people, most data doesn't work that way. Most data actually forces fragmentation down to more and more keys to look up. So you have to be very specific in the queries you want to make of these kind of things. But it works very well. Also, single biggest annoyance for me when dealing with back-end devs, uh, of which I am one, so this applies to me as well. Nobody ever splits roles, you know. 
Uh, the, the number of code bases I've seen where somebody's plonked in a role library for different roles that admins can, can have and users can have, they haven't divided their actual effect. I mean, because when you're writing a complex application to kind of talk with a database like this, you're effectively writing an operating system for it with readers and writers. And nobody splits them. So you've got these components that can act like God and read and write and update everything. And really, you want different components that do the different portions of that that have to prove they are trustworthy by talking over a secured link where they're done, yet again, they begin with certificates at some point, sadly. I wish there was a way of doing it that didn't require them because they are ugly. But anyway. But anyway, the other thing to bear in mind is anything you visualize as a data store, you can also visualize as a network. As a result, any trick you would use to secure a network, you can use to secure a data store. Conversely, any trick you would use that would naturally occur to you to secure a data store, you can translate into securing a network architecture. The, the two things are effectively equivalent when you look at them just in terms of crypto types. So, we're going to be very quick on operational rules because, to be honest, DevOps, yeah. <laughs> They're lovely people, but they get upset when you give them quite simple requirements like inject the, encrypt, you know, the encrypted jar file into the jar at one time uh, and then delete it from a Docker container. And then delete the Docker container. Apparently Docker doesn't like this. It, it took the DevOps that we asked to do that two and a half weeks to get Docker to do it. After which he said, I thought you were mad, but it works. I said, there you are. You're now a crypto specialist. <laughs> you can go off and you can inject one use binaries into things. Um, so, the third key thing operationally is to make sure that you have got trust anchored. Now, setting up a cert authority sounds unpleasant, and to some extent it is unpleasant, because if you're doing it via an SSL, the command line tool is just ugly. But there are a lot of, especially in this city, there are a lot of very good experts in doing certs. The whole of the banking world runs out of London and runs on certs. That's how they secure all their PKIs or their public key infrastructures. You know. So finding help with this in London is very easy. The advantage of working in the fintech capital is fintech uses security. You can find these people. Um, very expensive to hire full time though, which is So yet again, once you know you should be using roles, for God's sake, use roles for everything. Figure out exactly what the, the minimum threat surface you can expose anywhere is. Get your operators to actually accept that they work here and they don't work there. The idea that you've got one ops team that's going to run everything that you've got is an insanity, especially if you're building microservice architecture anyway, because you're going to have a lot of different components that you need specialists who are familiar with the quirks of that area of the system and then isolate, compartmentalize, split things off, put silos. I know that we all hate silos because it gets in the way of death. But silos exist in the security world, in the intelligence community, for very good reason. Getting across the silo is difficult. Everything on the other side is a foreign country, effectively. Um, audits. How many people here do code audits? How many people know now, Agile teams who like to do code audits. Bring this down for that. <laughs> um, I have nothing against agility and iterative development. All of my work I do using prototypes. But it is very beneficial from time to time to say thus far and no further and actually read the whole code base. Not just you read the whole code base. You read it to make sure that you haven't done anything stupid before you hand it to somebody whose job is just to read it and rip it to shreds. It takes like two or three days on, say, on a 15,000 line, 20,000 line code base, which for most web systems is what most people effectively end up with. Once you've got a component that's actually been audited, it doesn't need auditing again until it changes. So the great thing about microservice architectures is you can effectively ripple out the auditing across everything that we're doing. But that thing, once it's locked down, that has to be an immutable deployment now. And doing immutable deployments is one of those things that old school, old school sysops like. DevOps, I've discovered, are a bit more problematic. They just love shoving their Docker containers around too much um, to really want to say, 
fixed in stone. Um, you should actually be keeping track paperwork, if you've got regulatory requirements, but at least digital evidence of everything. Your security logs shouldn't just be being monitored by machines. There should be somebody who goes through these routinely and who tries to do abusive things based on them. Everybody who works in operation should expect that, yeah, from time to time they have to explain where they are, why they are, and what they're doing. Because otherwise, you're letting people popping into your data center if you have a data center, or in the case of if you're working on Amazon, you're relying on Amazon to not let somebody into a data center who shouldn't be there. Uh, what was that server theft the other day? Uh, you know, Bank. the one where they must have used a forklift truck to Lloyd's get it out. Yes, RSA. it was, wasn't it? Somebody just basically went into a secure data center with a forklift truck and came back out with several hundred, <laughs> hundred kilos of server. Um, very embarrassing for the company concerned. Never deploy without a credible security order. In fact, if possible, get yourself a stupid, horrible, unpleasant certification around ISO 27001. It doesn't actually require you to be secure, but it does require you to at least prove why you're not. And to at least address what you should do to get from there, and occasionally prove you're making progress. Because all that certification is really about is making sure you are trying to make progress. It's not really about you have nothing, it's about you trying to prove. Um, yet again, security audits are best done by third parties, preferably with an uh, attacker mentality. If you're not currently using a good pen testing house, they're well worth it. When you do a new architecture, get them to do a black box, then give them the, the full architecture, then let them do a white box for a week or two, knowing everything about what you've designed, then let them come in and spend a week doing it, having watched your ops team and how they work. You will be amazed what you will find out. It will never again make you want to let a dev put a piece of supposedly secure code on a server or as a very skilled ops run it. Because you'll suddenly think, ah, yeah, well, they, mm, I'm taking too much on trust when I do that. If you want to learn more about doing random stuff with crypto, some of which is related to this and some of which is just related to perverse uses of the DLS tree, uh, I have a whole pile of stuff I've done over the last nine years that's highly relevant. This is literally the last time I'm ever doing a talk in which there is code, which is why the code is in there, basically. I just wanted to complete the set. Um, and probably after this year, I won't be doing any more talks on privacy, just because of the fact I'd much rather actually be doing work in privacy than doing talking in privacy. But all of this stuff is free. It's the result of my, my partner and I's last 10 years of research. Um, and it's... Uh, it doesn't matter how much you think you already know on the subject, you will find something in there you didn't know. In Ruby. <laughs> so, and uh, I have been asked to make sure that people do, and I keep forgetting to do this myself, but uh, do, <laughs> the feedback doesn't really matter that much to me, because I mean, the, the, the thing I want people to take away from this is, there's something you can download off SlideShare in the next few days, that if you want to play around with crypto and go, you can. And if you like that, there's a book that you can get a free, a free 60 page chunk of to actually go and do a lot of little experiments and build it all your understanding as you go. So, anyway, thank you very much. That is Whispers.